There's an old saying in the aeronautical world that goes a bit like this. If it looks right, it'll fly right. Now this dates back to a time when aircraft were designed with slide rules, drawing boards and a bit more intuition, for want of a better word, than you would use today. Back then there was no supercomputer modelling of fluid dynamics. Aerodynamics were limited to using the wind tunnels of the time and computer controlled surfaces to control aerodynamically unstable designs weren't even a dream. In the early part of the 20th century, aerodynamic smoothing was all the rage and was seen in many places, on trains, on cars, and of course, on aircraft. So there was a certain amount of truth in the saying. Although, as we will see, if something looked a bit odd or strange and didn't conform to the right look, it didn't necessarily mean that it wouldn't fly right, it just might mean that it would fly differently to how you might expect. So in this video, I'm going to look at some of the stranger looking aircraft that you might think would have difficulty just getting off the ground and see why were they built in the first place and if they really do break the if it looks right, it flies right rule. Now, if anything exemplifies the experimental aircraft, it's the X-planes. Prototype aircraft built in the US since the 1940s that tested the boundary of flight and have led to some of the biggest breakthroughs in aviation. The X in the name represents experimental, and they were usually operated by NASA, its predecessor, the NACA, or DARPA. And boy, there have been some really rather experimental looking aircraft over years. But let's start with an interesting one. The Douglas X-3 Stiletto was a 1950s experimental jet aircraft with an incredibly long nose, a very gentle taper to an equally slim fuselage, semi-buried cockpit and windscreen, and tiny trapezoidal wings. The reason for this design choice was to try and create as little drag as possible at supersonic speeds, induce stability, and test the feasibility of low aspect ratio wings, shifting the loading from the wings to the fuselage. To combat the heat generated from the expected extreme speeds, it will be one of the first aircraft we made mostly out of titanium. However, things didn't go well from the offset. Its primary goal was to investigate the design features required for sustained supersonic speeds of up to Mach 2.6, 2,000 miles an hour or 3,200 kilometers per hour. The irony was that it was so seriously underpowered in level flight that it only managed to get to Mach 0.91 or 706 miles an hour or 1136 kilometers an hour at 20,000 feet. The only way it could get anywhere near the supersonic speeds it was designed to test was during up to 30 degree dives. The reason for this was that the planned Westinghouse J46 engines were unable to meet the size, weight and thrust requirements. So they fitted Westinghouse J34s, which only produced 4,900 pounds of thrust compared to the 7,000 pounds of thrust of the intended J46s. On its first flight, they soon discovered that this lack of power made it difficult to control, made worse by the high takeoff speed of 260 miles an hour, or 420 kilometers per hour. Although the X3 was designed to study supersonic stability, in tests when rolling the aircraft between Mach 0.9 and Mach 1.154, it would experience roll inertia coupling. This is where a maneuver in one axis, like rolling left or right, would cause an uncommanded maneuver in one or two of the other axes, like pitch and or yaw. And it very nearly led to the loss of the aircraft. This was early proof of a phenomena which usually occurred in particularly amongst long, thin aircraft designs. The X3 was good for test though, with most of its mass concentrated in the long, narrow fuselage rather than its wings, typical of fighter designs of the time. Of the two X3s ordered, just one was built. They toyed with the idea of replacing the J34s with rocket engines, but after 51 nerve-wracking test flights, it was decided that the roll inertia coupling and with even higher speeds, it would just be too dangerous to fly. The X3 was retired in 1956 and is now at the National Museum of the United States Air Force at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, Dayton, Ohio. Although the X3 never lived up to its expectations, 
it did provide valuable information on the dangers of roll inertia coupling. The small wings and titanium structure were used later in the Lockheed F-104 Starfighter and the high speed takeoff and landing pushed the development of tyre technology for aircraft. As for the very long nose, this has made a comeback in another much more recent X-plane, the Lockheed X-59, which is still in development. The very long nose design here is an attempt to fly supersonically with a very low sonic boom. Now, while aviation technology might not always be what it seems to be, today's sponsor NordVPN does what it says on the tin. And that is to make your browsing experience safer and better by keeping your real IP address hidden from hackers and trackers, whilst combining this with their built-in Threat Protection Pro that checks downloads for malware and links for connection to known fake, malicious, phishing, fraud, and even scam websites. Keeping your real IP address hidden allows you to look like you're in another part of the world, something which I use a lot because it allows me to visit websites in the US for research, but without being geographically blocked because ISPs still think the UK is in the EU, even though we left it over four years ago. Now you can do the same to view sports channels, movies and TV that you might not have access to in your country. And it can be used on up to six devices at once, which is great for the whole family. And if that wasn't enough, NordVPN now includes a dark web monitor that will check known hacker hangouts to see if your details are showing up even if you're not using the VPN feature. Act now and get my exclusive NordVPN two-year deal plus four months extra for free by using the link nordvpn.com forward slash CuriousDroid, which is in the top of the description below. And there's even a 30-day money-back guarantee. So it's risk-free as well. Now, from something which looked like it was a needle to something which looked like it shouldn't be able to fly at all and was nicknamed the flying bathtub for a reason. This was the NASA M2 F1, built for research into lifting bodies. Aircraft which gain their aerodynamic lift not from wings, but from the shape of the body itself. Essentially, a lifting body aircraft can be thought of as a fuselage, but without any wings. And in particular, these were designed for subsonic, supersonic or hypersonic flight, and particularly for spacecraft re-entry. The M2 F1 was a little bit more basic, being built out of mahogany plywood over a tubular steel frame, and with no engine, it was basically a glider. Its first flights in 1963 were by being towed behind a car along a runway, then being towed by a DC-3 at up to 12,000 feet, where it would be released and glide back to the runway, landing at 80 miles an hour or 130 kilometers an hour. In all, over 400 ground tow flights and 77 aircraft tow flights were made in the M2 F1. Its successor, the M2 F2, would be a true heavyweight flying laboratory, weighing in at over three tons and built by Northrop Corporation in 1966. These would be glide flights before powered test flights would be formed later. This time, the M2 F2 would be carried to 45,000 feet or 14,000 meters under the wing of a B-52. Everything went well up until the last of 16 flights, when it suffered from pilot-induced oscillation nearby a lake bed landing area as it was coming into land. The pilot, Bill Peterson, corrected the oscillation, but was then distracted by a rescue helicopter, which he thought might be a collision threat, and drifted into a crosswind on an unmarked area of the lake bed. Because there were no markers on the ground for the pilot to follow, he found it difficult to judge the height and hit the lake bed before the landing gear was fully deployed and locked. In the spectacular looking crash that followed, the vehicle rolled over six times, but the pilot survived and the airframe was rebuilt. The crash footage was later used in the opening credits of a $6 million man TV series. The third in this series of NASA lifting body vehicles was the HL-10, again built by Northrop Corporation. This added a third tail stabilizer and a Reaction Motors XLR-11 rocket motor with 8,000 pounds of thrust. During a typical flight, the HL-10 would be dropped from a B-52 at 45,000 feet. A few moments later, the rocket engine would be ignited and it would fly for up to 100 seconds of powered flight reaching between 
50 and 80,000 feet or 15 to 24,000 meters at speeds of up to Mach 1.86, making this the fastest lifting body aircraft in the program. It would then follow a simulated return from space corridor to land at the Rogers Dry Lake at Edwards Air Force Base, landing at about 200 miles an hour or 320 kilometers an hour. The UASF were also interested in lifting bodies, and in April 1969, the X-24A built by Martin Marietta was first flown. This looked even more like a plane that had been built without any wings, but was completely redesigned in 1972 into the X-24B, which its shape would then go on to greatly influence the space shuttle design after the initial HL-10 shape was considered and then rejected because the curvature of the lifting body would make it too difficult to attach an external fuel tank to. So the delta wing shape and design of the X-24B was used instead. The X-24B delta wing design was also an exercise in cost reduction as the rounded top flat bottom double delta plane form was cheaper to make than the continuously curved design of the HL-10. The X-24B performed similar figures to the HL-10, reaching a maximum speed of Mach 1.516 at 73,130 feet or 22,590 meters and flew 36 missions, 12 unpowered and 24 powered. Now we go from a supersonic plane with no wings to something that doesn't even look like a plane at all, with no wings, tail or fuselage, but can fly up, down, left or right and required no runway. Yes, we're talking about the Rolls-Royce thrust measuring rig, AKA the flying bedstead. And this was the first jet lift aircraft to fly anywhere in the world and would become the basis of probably the most famous VTOL or vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, the Harrier jump jet. The thrust measuring rig or TRM was built to explore the capabilities of new jet engines that were being developed after World War II. It used two Rolls-Royce Neen turbojet engines mounted back to back in a steel framework, which was supported on four legs with casters for wheels. To the left and right and forward and aft, there were compressed air jets, which were used to stabilize the craft when hovering and moving. Its first flight was in August, 1953. There were no lifting surfaces, so all the thrust was being directed downwards. Originally, it was used within a gantry-like arrangement, which it was tethered to, to prevent it from exceeding a defined area, and also from descending too fast. In 1954, it was moved to an open-air research facility to research artificial stabilization of both during hover and low-speed stages of flight. Although it could hover and move around with the thrusters, it didn't have a directional thrust as such, which meant wind speeds of more than six miles an hour or 10 kilometers an hour or greater would make it difficult to control. The biggest problem that new pilots to it found was the lag between the throttle movements by the pilot and the engine response time of around one to two seconds. But they soon learned to accommodate this and became quite adept at the height control. Two TMRs were built. The first one survived the failure of its vectored thrust system in September 1957 but the second one was destroyed a month later during a test flight leading to the death of its pilot, Wing Commander Larson, who had been piloted it for the first time. But the TMR was just a means to an end, and the next step will be to build an actual aircraft, and this will be the Short SC-1, built by Short Brothers of Northern Ireland. This used a much more conventional aircraft frame, so they will be able to fly both horizontally, but also take off and land vertically. To do this, they used five Rolls-Royce RB108 turbojet engines, four of which were mounted vertically and used for vertical flight, and one for the conventional horizontal flight, although by most reports it had a reputation as being a somewhat ungainly aircraft to fly. The SC-1 also introduced the first fly-by-wire and automatic stability control in a VTOL aircraft that could be switched to manual in the event of an automatic system failure. Two prototypes were built and began tethered flights in 1958. In 1960, it made its first free untethered flight 
and it appeared at the Paris Air Show in 1961 when it performed a demonstration flight. The second aircraft crashed during a test flight in 1963, which also killed its pilot. The cause was determined to have been a control malfunction. During the tests, it was found that almost any surface could be used to do the vertical takeoff and landings from, but the debris thrown up from the loose ground could be a risk to personnel nearby, but not to the aircraft itself. The vertical engines were mounted in pairs, which could be swiveled fore and aft for acceleration or deceleration along the longitudinal axis. In the later Hawker Siddeley Harrier, these would be replaced by one large Rolls-Royce Pegasus engine that directed its hot engine exhaust and compressed air from a large fan mounted on the front of the engine through a set of four rotatable nozzles. The fan also supplied compressed air to drive the puffer jets at the ends of the wings and the front and rear of the aircraft to give it control during hover maneuvers. The SC-1 prototypes were flight tested between 1957 and 1971 and the research that came from it resulted in the development of the Hawker Siddeley Harrier, which became the first operational VTOL aircraft, after which its retirement in 2006 was replaced almost 10 years later by the Lockheed Martin F-35B, which remains the only jet-powered VTOL multi-role aircraft in service today. Now this has been a very small list of aircraft out of so many that I could have chosen, but what were your favorite aircraft that you might thought didn't look right, but did fly right? Let me know in the comments below. And as always, thanks for watching and thanks to our patrons for their ongoing support.